start. Hello, welcome to Daily Strategies for Working Remotely with Silicon Valley Change and our coaches. Today, we're really thrilled. We're getting some comments, some answers back. Uh, we're thrilled to have today's episode be with Pete Barrage. Pete Barrage is a coach with us, but he's also been a coach for a really long time. And one of the coolest things that Pete's done, but he's done a lot of cool things, is he and his partner have started a company called, and have run it for a while, called Shift Positive 360. It's a tool for 360 assessments. We use it. Lots of coaches use it. It's awesome. And today, Pete is with us talking about the optimistic leader and how do you learn from wins, especially as you progress in your career over time as a manager. We're thrilled to have him here. Hello, Pete. We're thrilled to have you. Oh, it is a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, Senya. So I'm going to go ahead and share a screen then take you through a little presentation about being an optimistic leader and what that means. To begin though, I was uh, thinking about what sort of a leader are you? And I was hoping you'd be a little bit less like this and a little bit more like this as a participant today. And my hope today is that I can share with you a couple of concepts, one about optimism, another about learning from wins, and that from that you'll find at least one thing that you can take back with you, that you can make usable and, and helpful to you as a leader because you influence so many individuals in your organization, but also something maybe that you can apply for yourself at home. And I wanna begin then with positive psychology. Both of these constructs come from the field of positive psychology. And you've maybe heard a little bit about positive psychology because of Senya and her coaches and how they utilize it but it's the scientific study of what's right with individuals, organizations, and communities. And one of the founders of the field is Marty Seligman, and the underlying concept is this, that identifying and growing the positive is not the same as understanding or alleviating the negative. That mental health is more than the absence of mental illness, that well-being than the relief of suffering, and that studying pathology, distress, and dysfunction is not the same as studying resilience and strengths and growth. And for me, that's a light switch moment. When I became aware of that, it had such an impact for me. Because I prided myself in being a leader who could solve problems, who could dive in, break them down and try to, try to fix them. Something different. It was saying that we can learn from successes. We can learn from what's working. We can study strengths and that by studying what's broken, we're not automatically learning what's going to build us up in our relationships, our leadership, and so forth. So let me use an example to illustrate that. Gottman was a fantastic researcher, a really neat guy, had an opportunity to uh, uh, go out and hear him speak. And he's famous as a relationship researcher at being able to predict with 93.6% accuracy whether or not a relationship is gonna break down, whether a couple will get divorced after watching them have an argument for only 10 minutes. He gives them a subject that has been unresolvable in their relationship before. And what he watches for is these signs, criticism, contempt, defensiveness, and stonewalling. When those show up in the relationship, those relationships are more likely to fail. And that is an amazing example of using science to understand a problem. What an incredible level of accuracy and understanding of a problem. And yet, even that, this is what he had to say. At first, when I figured out how to predict divorce, I thought that I found the key to saving marriages. But like so many before me, I was wrong. I was not able to crack the code to saving marriages until I started to analyze what went right in happy marriages. Studying what was breaking them down didn't give, this, give the insight necessary to help chips flourish. It wasn't until he started to study those relationships that were actually flourishing that he learned how to help those, those have great relationships. And it's these sorts of things he found that were different, supporting the dreams of each other, turning toward, we make bids in our relationships with each other all the time throughout the day. And in those couples that were strong, the person would simply turn and acknowledge that bid. Also, when there was a difference of opinion, a potential argument, they would start with gentle startups. And they would find trust, shared meaning, commitment, appreciation, and other areas. So, 
<clears throat> that a is. A, I'm what's, sorry. What, what's a gentle startup? A gentle startup. So if there's a difference in opinion, if you it, rather than launching into an argument, they would hold their own perspective lightly and say, I'm thinking this. So it's not coming out of the gate with a really strong approach with the other individual, but rather holding your own assumptions, your own perspective lightly. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. And so if positive psychology is about looking at what works, then the first construct I want to take us into is around optimism. Now, first, a little bit about optimism. Research shows that optimistic people are more resilient, they're healthier, they do far better in sales, they live longer, literally, um, they do better in school, they're seen as better leaders, and uh, have better marital satisfaction. They also do better with cardiovascular outcomes and better cancer outcomes. So John Wooden, a famous basketball coach, described it this way, I believe one of my greatest strengths is my ability to keep negative thoughts out. I'm an optimist. I believe this results from the fact that I set realistic goals, ones that are difficult to achieve, but within reach. You might say I'm a realistic optimist. So what is optimism? I'll let you read this one for yourself. <laughs> I'll just laugh for everyone on the call. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I love this cartoon. So, so one way of thinking about optimism is, is a simple belief that the future will be better, expecting good experiences in the future. But a second way of looking at that is how Marty Seligman defined it in his research. And that is looking at our explanatory style. When something, uh, our explanatory style is how we explain things to ourselves. We have that voice going on all the time throughout the day that's talking to us. And he was interested in how do we explain things to ourselves when things go well? How do we explain it to ourselves when things go poorly? What he found is that an optimist, when something goes bad, they see that as a temporary uh, uh, setback with a very specific cause, meaning they're able to keep their troubles in a box. And they do take due blame for it, but not overly so. They don't beat themselves up terribly when something goes bad. The optimist also, when something goes well, when there's a good outcome, they spend more time with it. They see it as long lasting. They, they, they um, see that it will persevere. And they see that good things can lead to other good things. For example, I have a, a difficult conversation at work with a tough employee, and maybe that helps me in how I show up with a tough conversation with my son. So they see that good things can lead to other good things, and they also let it in. They take due credit for that good thing that happened. You know, if we just let the, the, the compliment or the, the credit roll off our back, people stop, stop bringing us that good news because we don't let it in. These individuals do. And so um, a pessimist, on the, other, on the other hand, is just the opposite. When something bad happens, they see it as being long-lasting, and they see it leading to other bad results. They spiral. They're unable to keep their troubles in a box, and they beat themselves up when they do it. And the pessimist, when something good happens, they see it as being short-lived. And they say, that's great, but what's next? And they don't see that good things lead to other good things. So um, they have kind of that mindset of, this is bad, and it's not going to change. And when something good happens, um, that uh, uh, yeah, that's not going to last, and they move on. So why is it that optimism pays off? It's not just fuzzy thinking. This is actually a skill that people develop. People with optimism do better in these outcomes I talked about earlier because they stick with it, they persevere. They're able to, when that sales rejection comes, they're able to stick with it and uh, try again and try again. And so it's the ability to face the current reality also with the perspective that um, the future can be bright, that realistic optimism. They're accurate and flexible in their thinking. So there's an assessment that I use with the executives that I work with, the leaders that I work with in my coaching, and it's the optimist test. It's available for free. I'll put the website up in just a little bit here. 
And I use it because we want to understand the thinking style of these leaders. We're often working with them on their thinking patterns and how that affects them and their ability to be successful. And an interesting thing happens. Um, I've noticed in the years that I've been using this Optimus test, and that is the higher up in the organization I go, the better individuals seem to be at the bad news. So with VPs and CEOs, what I find is that they're pretty good with bad, bad news when it happens. They'll say, that's okay, we lost a client, we'll get another. Um, or we had a tough quarter, we'll get through this. And I chalk that up to experience a lot. They've been there before. Unfortunately, they tend to suck at the good stuff. When something good happens, they use that same mindset saying, that's good, what's next? Excellent, what's next? We had a good quarter, what's next? And so oftentimes we're working to slow down that explanatory style and get them to let in the good, to learn from the good, to apply it in other, other places, to break that habit that they have and see good stuff as more long lasting. Now, when I go down toward more of the middle management that I work with, there they actually are better at the good stuff. They do take a little bit more time to soak it up, let it in, and learn from it a little bit. And uh, they struggle a little bit more with the bad news because they don't have quite as much experience. So here's the first opportunity for you, the first follow-up uh, action. And that would be, I'd, I'd encourage you to go to a website called AuthenticHappiness.com and take the Optimist test for yourself. See where you come out. And it's available, it's free. There's um, millions of applications of this. It's well-tested. And so the challenge for you then is how can you see the good as being long lasting and leading to other good things? And see the bad is this too shall pass and to be able to keep your troubles in a box. So if we can change our level of optimism as an individual, savor and learn from good news, what can we do together? How can we learn from wins? You may be familiar with the negativity bias. This is our evolutionary um, instinctual response to threats, whether it's physical threats or social threats. Our brains are designed to see threats and problems. We tune into them, they grab our attention. That's why negative emotions are stronger than positive when it comes to grabbing our attention and <clears throat> potential threats grab that attention from us. So in essence, to make this shift, I'm asking you to actually battle your biology a little bit, to get past the brain stem, fight, flight, freeze, the amygdala, that emotion response center, uh, before things get up to the logic center in your prefrontal cortex. We're moving past that. We have to be intentional to do that. And what I like is how Marty Seligman, I'll explain the picture now, how Marty Seligman described the negativity bias. He said, the negativity bias is like your tongue. Your tongue is forever swirling around your mouth and it is checking for invaders. And when it finds that popcorn husk stuck in the teeth, that's where the attention goes. It is gonna work on that until it dislodges that piece of popcorn husk. That's the negativity bias, how it hijacks us. But it's not that frequently that our tongue is just swirling around our mouth, checking out our teeth and saying, hmm, they're so smooth and so pretty and uh, fresh. So that's what we're trying to work through, through intentional action. We often turn our attention to what happened in the valley when things turn out poorly. And this isn't about trying to get you to ignore that, to, to look past that. This is simply because you hone that skill as a leader to be able to problem solve and to help others problem solve. But this is about honing your skill, adding to it by also looking at what's happening here. When is the problem not a problem? What's leading to our successes and how is it that we can do that again so that when we recover through another valley, we can actually be higher in our peak one more time. And the reason for that is because these are the shortcuts to your future success, learning about your past successes. An example that I like to share is about Jerry and Monique Sternin. They look like the kind of people that you maybe would sit next to on a cruise at dinner probably the early seating, I'm guessing. And Jerry and Monique Stern, in, in 1990, were working with an organization called Save the Children. And they were asked to come to Vietnam to help solve a problem of malnutrition in children. 65% of children under the age of five 
suffered from some form of malnutrition. That's a huge problem. And they were told that they had six months to do it or they had to leave to show some impact or they would leave, have to leave. Now, how can t just a few people make an impact in a countrywide problem? So what they chose was an approach called positive deviance. And this positive deviance approach, what they did is they had volunteers go out and they had them weigh children to get a baseline measurement and ask the parents about their level of income, find out about income levels. And they're classified as poor, very poor, or very, very poor. And the interesting thing is what they found is that there were outliers. There were those individuals, those children in very, very poor families that were at weight. They were not suffering from malnutrition. What an incredible insight, because then it says that we can do this in other families, that if the poorest families can have well-nourished children, then we can as well. Told their neighbors that they could do that. So they had to go further in their research then, and say they started to do observations. And what they found, because this didn't come up in the interviews, but what they found is that those families did three things differently. First, when they went out to the... Uh, uh, when they went out to the rice paddies, they would not only gather the rice, but they would also grab shrimp and crabs and snails and put them in with the shrimp. And they would cut off the tops of the sweet potatoes and they would add that in uh, uh, with the rice as well, excuse me, with, with the rice. And that was considered to be a little unusual, inappropriate, or even dangerous. Um, however, that's what those families were doing. And it gave those children uh, protein, iron, and calcium. The second thing that they found is that those families had unusually good hand hygiene. They just simply washed their hands more and better. And the third thing that they found is that most families ate before they went to the fields and after they came home twice a day. In these families, what happened is that they would have the older children working with, staying home with the very young uh, children and they would feed them throughout the day. The same overall portion, but in that way they could finish the meals. And uh, so they would feed their children four and five times a day rather than just the twice a day. So what would you do? Well, you'd go out and tell everybody, correct? No. If, if we were to do that, would we be believed? Would the people coming in from outside be believed and would people follow that instruction? Rather, what they did is they held gatherings where they had those families come forward and talk about what they were doing. And when you can literally see another person's children and, and make that comparison, it has such an impact on those individuals that they were able to um, adapt. We don't need those experts from the outside. We can look at where is the problem, not a problem. That's what positive deviance is about. And at the end of a two-year pilot, because they were asked to stay, malnutrition had fallen by 85% in those communities and been expanded over five years to more than 250 communities. Jerry and Monique Stern are credited with saving tens of thousands of lives in addition to that were the children yet to be born to those families that now had new behaviors. So that is an example of using positive deviance and looking at when is the problem not a problem. And an example here in business is Hunter Douglas. What Hunter Douglas does is uh, they, um, when, something, when something, their productivity goes from say 85% on the line to 92%, that's when they actually stop and gather people up and say, what are we doing? What's working here? And how can we do it more frequently? Because we know we've been able to do it now. Or an individual uh, that I was working with, a chief creative officer at, a, at an ad agency, I was coaching him and all of a sudden his whole affect changed. And I said, what's going on? He said, well, I got to get to this meeting. It's kind of a bummer. And I'm like, well, what is that? He said, it's a post-mortem. We lost a client. We bring people together and we look at uh, uh, what went wrong and it becomes a big blame game. Everybody points at everybody else. Nobody wants to be there. People bag off to the meeting. I said, that sounds pretty terrible. What do you do when you win the client? And then he looked at me like I was an idiot. And he said, uh, we do the work. That's what we do. And I was like, but do you under try to understand that as well? And he said, no. And so we talked about this positive deviance approach. And by the time I got home from his office, he had put together a deck changing the purpose of the committee. The worst thing is that he was one of the co-chairs of the committee and he hated his own meeting. So what he did then is he changed the purpose and he said, we're no longer gonna dive into what's broken, but rather we're going to, when we have a success, we're going to try to understand that. What makes us different? What makes us unique and why people choose us? And so then what he would do, the actual, to make this happen is they would 
uh, uh, bring people into their meetings. They called the Collabcom, beautiful glass room. And then for the first five minutes, they would have people share a success recently. And then they'd take a quick vote and they would say, which one do we want to dive into? And for the next 55 minutes, that's what they would map out on the walls. They would write on these glass walls. You know, where did the call come from? How did the client hear about us? How did the receptions take that call? How did we put together our team? Where did the creativity happen and what supported that? How did we sit in the car before we went in to make the pitch? And how have we treated them ever since? And from that, they learn more about their unique successes, their unique differences that they can expand upon. So with that is the second opportunity for you, the second action. And that is I want you to consider supplementing your postmortems, which I assume many of you do, with a learning from win session. Instead of, I'm not saying do away with your postmortems completely, but at least bring that same mentality to your successes. What can we learn from when the problem is not a problem, when our successes are actually happening? So there's my quick overview of optimism and learning from wins. And my challenge for you, my hope is that personally, professionally, with optimism, you maybe take that assessment where you can just simply practice making the good more long lasting and see how it leads to more good stuff and the bad, not so much. And with learning from wins, dig into one of your successes, They're your shortcut to your future wins, or even simply start one of your meetings with who has a win. And let's learn about that, not from a recognition, and, and pat on the back standpoint, but from an actual, what helped that to happen so that we can do it again? So there we go. Okay, thank you. Optimism and learning from wins with Pete Barrage. Thank you so much. Thank you for everyone who joined right up through this 20 minute mark. And we're going to do Q and A with Pete now. So thank you for those who came just for the crisp part. And this is your chance to be coached by Pete. So I always ask this question, first of all, type in your questions, but secondly, what are you taking away? Pete specifically suggested practice making the good more long lasting and learning from wins. Is it one of those two? Is it a different perspective? Is it trying to become the next Jerry and Monique Stern in, in your field? What are you taking away? So would you please jot down both here in the Facebook group? What are you taking away from today? I'll start with the first question. Pete, suppose uh, s someone here on the call has a very, uh, I don't know how to say this politely, has a very negative boss. And their boss starts meeting with meetings with postmortems and starts with what's going wrong. Let's fix all the things that are going wrong, which is very normal because that also does lead to results. What can you do if that is how your boss manages meetings and even your one-on-ones? So I would say that one of the reasons why um, bosses and, and we shy away from the uh, successes is because we view the successes when we talk about them as being about recognition, about saying a good job. And this is different. This is about actually learning from those successes. And I think with that mindset then, it's that ability to say, you know what, we also landed this client and here's why we think we did. And when you start getting into that, then people perk up, people get interested in that. But if you just stop with the, here's the good thing that happened, you know, we, we, we landed another client, then it's like, okay, great job, next. So I think it's going a little bit further um, that here's what happened, or here, here's the win that we had and here is what we think led to that. When you start putting that out, then people get really curious. I even see the change in your face, Senya, when, when I um, said that. Yeah. So two things that that makes me think of. One is uh, just the, the responsibility on everybody in that room. So not if you're just sharing the win, but you're not sharing the and this is what I learned about working with clients in general because of this win. You're, you're sort of shortchanging the discussion yourself. You're uh, kind of setting up a good job as opposed to setting up a curiosity. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And, and the second thing I'm hearing from what you're saying is this fits right in line with the three good things, the exercise in positive psychology, where at the end of the day, you might, or you might with your spouse or with your kids, you might say, what are the three good things that have happened? And that really important follow-up questions is question is why did they happen? What did you do to contribute? What did yeah. the, everything else? You're smiling. Yeah. What, what led to that? Yeah. What, what, led to it? Helped? what brought that about? 
coming okay. up with a ton of those different probes, those coaching types of questions, you'll see your kids go deeper. Mm -hmm. What did you learn about yourself? How did that feel? Mm -hmm. How might you do it again? What do you have as your hopes now for tomorrow? Yeah. Can you give us an example of a situation in which you've taken a client who completely doesn't believe in any of this and kind of had them switch their thinking to believe in optimism, to believe in learning from wins? Well, that chief creative officer is the guy that comes to mind right away because it was so, it was such a big switch. And because he was literally frustrated that he was the co-chair. Here was a meeting he was leading that he did not even like himself. But he felt that's what you do in business. You have to dissect what's broken. Yeah. And that switch was immediate. I mean, literally, it took me 25 minutes to drive home. And when I got there, he had like a 15 slide deck to convince his uh, co-chair and the rest of the team. And he went even further. He said, we're no longer going to look at what breaks us down. We are going to look at what makes us unique and why it is that people select us. And we're going to know that inside and out so we can do it again and again. So he was a, a convert in, in like that. And what was cool, the, the really important thing, though, is you have to develop the structure to support it. He came up with this structure all on his own, getting the ideas out there, taking a vote, and saying, which one of these do we want to understand more fully? And people started coming to the meetings. They were engaged. Oh, yeah. And it was fun. Yeah. yeah, it was fun. <laughs> right? we, all, we often forget about that element of work that it's, it's such a large part of our life. It can be fun. And it was, such a, it was such a light switch for him because he lives in the place of creativity. He, he, he comes up with these incredible concepts for clients to be able to convey what it is that they do for their consumers. And yet he was stuck in what felt like this, this I got to solve problems um, because that's what business is. It's like, no. So he got to leverage his strengths. Yeah. Let's turn this back in our remaining couple of minutes to the coronavirus and these times that we're in. And uh, what I'll just ask you and, and wonder whether the people on the call will either you can type it in or just think it to yourself. How are you learning from your own wins right now, Pete? Like just in being at home. I know you and I both work remotely a lot of the, of the time anyway. But what wins are you learning from in this situation? I was being coached by a student this morning because I'm a, I'm a mentor coach and she did a great job. And I've been finding this balance, being able to focus on my work and then go down and work in the house. And we're doing remodels. And what I was finding was the win was um, when my internal dialogue was going negative, when I, I'm, I'm replacing a, a wood floor. And when my mind would be telling me, um, oh, you just screwed up a board. You didn't make the cut right. You didn't measure right. It was that ability to let that thought go as if it was from elsewhere so that I could say, yeah, it's a piece of wood, you know, at least I'm working with my hands. So that one literally just came up this morning because another coach, a, a, a student coach got me to that point of being able to see this is what I've been working on, letting go the negative um, uh, uh, pessimistic uh, perspective when something goes bad. So you did it, you let it go. But again, for those of us on the call for whom that's, uh, I know I should let it go, but I haven't quite let it go. What, what do you suggest? Uh, mindfulness has helped me a ton. It, understanding that the thoughts that come to mind are not me. Mm -hmm. My brain, as I was taught by my uh, 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 meditation teacher, Michael Brady, said, your mind just throws shit out there. And so that's its job. It doesn't mean it's true. You don't have to hang on to it and believe, oh, that's me. It's just like an idea, a thought machine. And so you can choose to take that thought or you can choose to let it go. And I work on that a lot. I am going to directly share that with my kids later today in that kind of like popcorn machine way. <laughs> that's nice. That's nice. Yeah. Pete Verage, thank you so much. Thank you so much for being with us and for doing this webinar with us. This was awesome. Thank you. A pleasure. It's a pleasure. Thank you. We look, we look forward to seeing all of you again tomorrow at 11 a.m. for 20 minutes of daily work remote strategies. Thanks so much, Pete. Pete may do another one with us in a few weeks, so I'll send an email out if he does. All the best to everyone. Thank you so much, Pete. Thank you.